So everybody, give a big, big, warm round of applause to Jeff Patton. He's the glue that connects good product management and strategy, a lean user experience and agile delivery practices together. Jeff, welcome. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm, my goal is to mess up everything here. I wasn't here yesterday. I didn't hear Alistair speak, but uh, Alistair's an old friend, and I, he makes a, uh, an impression everywhere. And he might have said something about collaboration and people and things like that being important. And I just saw my friend Alberta speak, and she talked about people being important. And I'm about to tell you, they don't matter. <laughs> um, uh, look, I, don't, I see the world sort of outside in, and I, I think I'm going to tell you that Screw the people, screw the organization. Uh, you, I'm going to make a point that the way we work is a function of the stuff we do. It's a function of the stuff we build. And the world is changing fast enough that you, we won't have to worry much about agile transformation anymore. If your company doesn't transform, it might die. And it has nothing to do with people, just the world. Um, I need to tell a brief history, I need to describe a brief history of product development or how we got here. Look, I need to start in the olden days of tech products and old tech products or 1980s and 1990s. I need to, uh, there's some milestones here, well, like in 2001 when, well, when we start to discover this agile stuff, and 2011 is a sort of important milestone, and then I want to fast forward to today and talk about why things are different and why process looks a lot different today than when I started building software in the 1980s and 1990s. I am super old. Um, now, <laughs> before, you know, it's funny, I would have thought I was the older per oldest person here. Actually, I think I am. Alistair is older than me, but Alistair gets younger every year and I get older every year. <laughs> Alistair's regressing to his teenage years, I think. Uh, he's going to be 13 in 10 years. Um, now, I have a question for you before we start, because we're talking about products, and I want to kind of drive this from product thinking. So if I were to ask you what makes a product great, what are characteristics of a great product, I need you to shout out, and everybody's going to shout over each other, but I'll say again. It, uh, say it again, it covers a need. Uh, if I heard covers right, but yeah, there's definitely a need, yes. What else? It makes money. It makes money, <laughs> because your company needs money. Uh, well, uh, what else? Oh, uh, shoot, I'm sorry, there you said. It tells a story? Is that what you said? <laughs> uh, so I've never heard that before. Nobody said, I love this product because it tells a story. But, uh, but I'm going I'm to write it down <laughs> because I think it's, there's something there important. What else did I hear? Solves a problem, and what else? People use it, yeah. and uh, you can see these are connected. Uh, people use it, and it solves a problem, and it probably, they probably use it because it solves a problem. <sighs> I can't spell. What else? Oh, man, this is terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> I heard there and then over there. What? That changes people's lives, yeah. And what did I hear over there? One more time. L-E-S, lives, I don't care. It's, it's, it's so it looks like that. What did you say over there? Did you say, I, I heard value, I thought. Gives, gives value, is that it? Uh, it's intuitive. What else? Innovative, yeah, sorry. I'll listen with an American accent. Okay, this may be enough, but you're helping me sort of make a point here. First off, no one said it's on time or under budget or, or any of those things because those aren't the things that make a product great. I started, actually, let me rewind. I didn't start building software in the 1980s, actually maybe 1989 or 1990, but in 1980s, I squandered my college degree working in a store that sold software. Uh, computer software, but that's actually that is not me. Uh, but I looked a lot like that, and my store was called Software and More, and it's not software, etc. And I, I want you to think back to what software looked like in the 1980s and 1990s. What did software look like in the 1980s and 1990s? Yeah. Uh, I, there was a lot of words in there, I th but I, I think I heard somebody say, you bought it in a box. 
Um, now, software was stuff we sold on shelves. This, in fact, this is one of the boxes I sold an awful lot of because the 1980s and 1990s, a personal computer was a thing and people would spend thousands of dollars on a personal computer and all it could, well, it didn't, they weren't nearly as powerful as the watch I'm wearing these days. And we would buy educational programs for our kids because that was how we would justify our purchase because it would make our kids smarter. This is a piece of software I sold an awful lot of and you'll notice it comes in three and a half and five and a quarter inch floppy disks and the company that made that software and there were a lot of companies making software had to make a lot of decisions about what went in their software and it was important that their boxes sold. Let me draw a quick drawing here, and everybody knows this. Anybody who's ever seen me give a talk has seen me draw this drawing way, way, way too much. Um, but I'm going to draw it and get it out of the way. When I learned to build software, I think I started in 1989 as a first job actually building software, uh, I learned that basically software development all starts with ideas. And if we were building a whole new product, it was a whole product idea. Uh, well, the product was filled with features. If we already had a product, we might add enhancements to it. But all those things in software development were what we called our requirements. Now, I'm in software development, so I need to turn those things into boxes, into stuff we could ship, into features, enhancements, or things we could ship. And there's always a lot of pressure to do this fast, or time mattered a lot. In software development, well, of course, the cost matters, but in software development, cost is a function of the number of people it's going to take to build this thing or our, our team size. So how many people are going to take and how long is it going to take? And then, of course, all this stuff, that's the scope. Everybody's heard of this time, cost, and scope triangle thing, right? Say yes. Yes, good, thank you. Uh, because this is the bad news triangle. There's only bad news here, there's only misery, uh, because we want to know what we can get, how long it's gonna take, and how much it's gonna cost, but you can't. If you insist on knowing the time and scope, then the bad news is it's gonna take more people. If you insist on knowing the time and the cost, then the bad news is you're gonna get a lot less scope. And if you insist on knowing all three, then the bad news is there's actually four. The fourth thing is quality, if you fix all three, then quality squeezes out like toothpaste in a toothpaste tube. Software development sucked. It was super hard. But, um, well, this is actually not product development. It's software development. Uh, it's, this is the world we live in when we're concerned with, with projects. But when we're concerned with products, things start way upstream. They start by looking at the world as it is now. They start by looking at, well, the product we already have, if we've already got one, or well, maybe the products we wish we had, or most importantly, we talk to the customers that we already have or customers we wish we had. And if you do that, you're gonna find that some of those customers are not so happy. Some of those customers are uh, frustrated or angry. Some of those customers might be just confused and struggling. And the work we do to understand our, our customers and our users and their problems, well, that's where those ideas come from. It's weird that we used to call that capturing requirements, uh, but it's, uh, well, understanding problems and things like that. Now, if we carry this model forward, what we hope is true after we ship is that those people that were unhappy are happy now, and the problem is, well, if you're delivering a product, there's a lot of people there, and some of those people are less happy, and some of those people you just can't please. What we hope is true is that those people that we ship to see what we built, and they try it, and they use it, and they keep using it, and that they, ideally, they say good things about it. Somewhere along the way here, we hope that they pay us some money, and, right, hold on a second, I'm in the EU. Um, and, or if we built it for internal use, we hope that we save some money because we're efficient. And it, if I draw this much of the model, you say, oh, yeah, yeah, look, if this doesn't happen, then it doesn't matter if we were on time or not. And you'll notice that a lot of the things you said come from there. Uh, it solves a problem and people use it and gives value. Well, those are 
all those things. There's no giving value here. There's no solving a problem until things come out. Now, if I draw this much of it, it sounds like all we gotta do is make people happy and everything will be awesome, but that's not the way it works either. Software development or product development starts upstream. It starts upstream in your organization. Your organization has a, a different problem to solve. It needs to survive. It needs to sustain itself. And it does not sustain itself on happy customers. It sustains itself on money. And there are people in your organization that will pay attention to sustaining metrics like your revenue and your costs. And, and we call those people business stakeholders. And they'll watch all that money stuff. And if that money stuff is flat, they will be unhappy. Now, they're not unhappy because using the software sucks or it's hard or we need more features. They're unhappy because our organization isn't making money or sustaining itself or growing or covering costs right. And hopefully they give guidance on what customers and users and problems to focus on. And that if we rattle all the way through here, if we deliver something that is awesome and people see it and try it and use it, well, if a few people do, that's just interesting. But if a lot of them do, that's when we start to feel it in our organization. That's when those metrics go up. That's when people inside get happy. They are not happy because it's fun to use the feature. They're not happy because it solves a problem or covers a need. They're happy because it makes money. Uh, well, we measure benefit in here with things like return on investment. If lots of people say good things that helps our brand and brand awareness or things like net promoter score, if lots of people tell others and more users use it, that's gonna help our market share. Your company needs these things to sustain itself, but it doesn't get these things unless, uh, well, these people get those things. I'll draw this model over and over because we are plagued or with annoying useless words like goal and objective. Well, they're not that useless. It's just that we can use the word goal to say it's a goal to get this stuff delivered on time. Or we can say it's a goal uh, to in increase user satisfaction with this product or get more users using it. Or it's a goal to get return on investment or see better net promoter scores, things like that. Th those those goals can stretch to fit. So I think some people see me draw this model before, if you've seen me speak before, you have. Uh, I do this so that we can label the difference between this output, the stuff we build, and this outcome stuff, the stuff that comes out. The annoying thing about outcome, and, and you can see that most of those, everything here comes from this side of the model, the annoying thing about outcome especially is it's nothing that anyone inside your company can do. This is why the people inside your company, it's oddly irrelevant sometimes. It's not the people inside your company that see, try, use it, and keep using it. It's the people outside that do. We rely on them changing their behavior, and even worse, we rely on them changing how they feel about us. And those are the things that your team doesn't do. Even if you're building software for internal use, that building software for internal use solves a lot of problems because they will see, try, and use it because they have to, because it's their job, and we will fire them if they don't do it and keep using it. But we cannot make them more efficient, we can't make them more effective, and we can't make them actually use it and save money. That's one of the things we can't predict or know either. Now, um, some people refer to everything out here as an outcome. I like using the term impact because I want to separate these impactful business things from these outcome things. Now, I need to draw this model because I sort of want you to understand that we know what makes a product great and it's everything over here and nothing in here. Well, or we have to do these things so we get these things and that's why this matters. Now, I do I care about this? Yeah, I'm gonna bring this up. I've got too many topics I wanna to throw in here and I hope I don't run too late. One of the things, uh, if we talk about the 1980s and 1990s, this is always the way products have worked. It, the, the a problem is th this is hard. And a long time ago, and actually it was 1986, these two Japanese authors made a comparison well, they, they said product development is messy and it's hard. And they said, look, if you're really doing it right, they drew some nasty models with lots of overlapping cycles where all things were happening at once and it was super chaotic. And these guys, uh, and well, it's, this is a Harvard Business Review article, and they were talking about 
well, in 1986, they were talking about not software, but things like copiers and uh, computers and cameras and, uh, you know, they talked to people like Honda on, air, on cars and, uh, uh, well, these are a bunch of traditional package products. Now, some of you probably know what this paper's for. Why is this paper relevant? Yeah, you know, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, the, this, in this paper they said it's super messy, uh, but it's okay because there's a certain order to it. They, they compared the way that people work to the, the sport of rugby. Or they said, look, it's more like a team sport. It's a game. And if we're going to win this game, we, we can't have precise process and rules. We need to rely a lot more on, uh, gosh, where do they say this? Things like self-organizing teams. Uh, and, well, it's at one place they made it, they use the word Scrum here, and this is where Agile processes like Scrum get their name. This is why Scrum is called Scrum, is because of this paper. Now, the reason this is a thing is because they were balking at a lot of tradition in 1986 that said we should have an orderly process. They were trying to say, no, messy is the way this works. It's crazy, it's chaotic. Uh, and when we work this way, we see more success here not more on-time projects. The paper doesn't say people were more on time. The paper says they were more successful. The paper also describes how they spend a lot of time talking to customers and users, and oddly, the paper describes a lot of other experimentation and things that they did. Now, all this is necessary because in the product world, life sucks. The, the biggest problem with this model is right here. It's this idea thing. And there are three big problems with ideas. The first one is that there are always too many. You know, if you talk to any of your users or customers, they will have ideas. If you talk to any stakeholders in your building, they will have ideas. If your company is big and successful, this only gets worse because you have more customers with more ideas and more stakeholders with more ideas. And it just puts a lot of back pressure on the system. Now, the other big problem with all these ideas is that most of them suck. Now, let me see if I can give you a little bit of evidence that most suck. If, if you had an idea for a new product and you were going to quit your job and create a startup to create your new technology product, well, let me, you may know, or what are the, what's the failure rate of technology startups? Yeah, it's a lot. Um, like I've got a couple statistics, a 92% from the, the Startup Genome Report. They've been doing this for a lot of years and they can isolate startup successes and failures to different geographic areas and different markets, things like that. Now, uh, look, we all know anecdotally that if you've got a new technology product idea, your odds of success aren't very good. But a weird thing happens with companies, uh, once they get a product on the market, once they are sustaining their business, they start to think all their feature and capability ideas are going to be awesome from now on. But uh, look, there's not as good a numbers on this, or one study that a lot of people cite is a survey study from the Standish Group called the Chaos Report. And depending on the year that you look at this study, they will say anywhere between 65 and 75% per, uh, of features we put into products fit into the rarely or never used category. Now, I'm leaving from here to go to London, and then I will go to Australia. One of the companies I always visit in Australia is Atlassian. Does anybody use Atlassian products, specifically things like Jira, out of curiosity? So for all those people who are using Jira, you know what a product feels like when 65 to 75% of the features are rarely or never used. <laughs> Atlassian did this mistake or uh, kind of a process error of uh, throughout the 90s or when the product is pretty old and into the 2000s, they, they did this thing like they asked customers what they liked and wanted and for the features that customers wanted a lot, they would put into their product. Now, have you ever bought a product off the shelf, taken it home, and used it, and said, eh, this kind of sucks, and stopped using it? Anybody ever done that before? So this is how good we are uh, at predicting what we will use ourselves. Uh, now, uh, when lots of people did this for Atlassian, uh, the cool thing about, at least for those customers that asked Atlassian for features, they did not have to pay for them. Atlassian did. And I guess, in a way, we all pay for them because they're sitting there in the user interface and we all have to work around them. 
Um, there's an old saying that if you improve a product long enough, you will eventually ruin it. And Atlassian knows that Jira is ruined. That's why there is a Jira next gen uh, that you should be using because Jira is, on the, is in the process of being sunset. Look, these were all, all features fall into things that seem like a good idea at the time. Now, let me quote one person. This guy's name is Marty Kagan. Marty Kagan, if you read one book on product management or product thinking, Marty Kagan's book, Inspired, it should be the one you read because it's a little bit of a gospel for product managers. Kagan started his career at Netscape, uh, well, actually HP, and then Netscape working for a guy named Ben Horowitz and Mark Andreessen, but when browsers started to be part of operating systems and the uh, the world changed. Uh, Marty went to work for a company called eBay, which was a smaller startup in the Bay Area. eBay had 100 or so people. Marty was hired to run product management there, and Marty stayed with eBay up until around 2008 and helped grow that company from 100 or so people to thousands of people and uh, to, a, well, to a global in size. Marty, who was in charge of product management and user experience there, said, I remember him telling me nonchalantly that if you are really good at this stuff, you will be right about a third of the time. In my head, I immediately inverted that number and said, are you telling me that if I'm really good at this stuff, I'm going to be wrong about 70% of the time? And he said, yeah, but only if you're really good. Most people aren't that good. And look, if a consultant tells you that, if I tell you that, don't believe it, but if the person who ran eBay for a, a decade plus and saw that happen over and over says it, you kind of have to believe it. Now, the, the quote he would go on the record is that 50 to 80% of all the software we ship fails to accomplish its objectives. That's, that's what he would say. But the, the big point here is, look, most of what we build sucks, so the, the faster we build things, well, the faster we build crap, the more crap we get. Uh, and that's, that's it. Now, here's the third bad thing. Look, think back to those startups. Has anybody ever visited, there's got to be here in Athens and on other places, anybody ever visited a startup accelerator or incubator before? So good, you, you know what these co-working spaces are where lots of startups are working under one roof. And if you walk into these places, you'll see five, 10, and there's, a, there's startup accelerators I've visited that have over 100 startups in multiple floors in big buildings in Chicago and Boston. If you walk into one of these places, first off, I expect them to be super sad, gloomy places. Uh, and it's surprising that they're not. The, the, Look, if I were to tell you that 80 to 90% of your employees were going to be laid off over the next year at your company, your company would be depressing. But when you walk in, all these startups seem pretty upbeat. And it's not because they're stupid. It's not because they think most startups are successful. If you talk to any one of the startup founders, the people working for the startups, they will say, yes, most startups fail. 90% of startups will fail. Most of, their, most of these ideas suck, but not ours. This is the world we live in. Uh, we, we call this bias, uh, specifically optimism bias, when we imagine the future and imagine everyone is going to see, try, and love this stuff, and we will make tons of money. Uh, the, this is, we are cursed with this future-perfect imagination. So this is what the product world looks like, and this sucked. And uh, I, I'm drawing this in the 1980s and 1990s. This is always what it will look like, especially with technology products, and these things are getting more and more expensive. In the 1980s and 90s, you used to be able to build a, an interesting piece of software with a few developers. But by the time we get to the 2000s, it's taking dozens, hundreds of developers, and we see catastrophic failures, not just things that are running long, but things that are just running long and dying in the market, and uh, things are awful. So look, all during that time, you know, just like in the 1980s, there are people that are figuring out better ways of doing things. And so we're at an Agile conference. So you all know that in 2001, we got Agile development. We got the Agile manifesto. And out of Agile thinking, we got a lot of good things. Actually, let me pull up a slide here. First off, Agile development starts with the premise uh, that uh, Everything's gonna suck, so just ship it. Um, 
you get values like we want working software for comprehensive documentation because the sooner we see something working, we can start to then evaluate or hopefully start to see some of those outcomes. And since we will be wrong, let's just focus on responding to, to that. Uh, and then, again, you get core principles like well, continuous delivery of valuable working software, and working software is the primary measure of progress. So out of this, we, we get a lot of this posture of just shipping it. Um, I started a company in 2000. In 2000, the company I worked for hired this guy. His name is Kent Beck, and he had written this book called Extreme Programming Explained. Now, at this very first company I worked for, my job title was product manager, and this was the process we were using. And uh, Kent you know, makes a pretty clear point. Well, I'm going to go back to the requirement stuff. In, in describing what stories were, he said that software development has been steered wrong by the word requirement, defined in the dictionary as something mandatory or obligatory. The word carries a connotation of absolutism and permanence, inhibitors to embracing change, and the word requirement is just plain wrong. So it's funny, since I learned stories from this guy, when people say we use stories for our agile requirements, I hear this guy in my head is thinking, ah, this is, you're making him twist. Uh, it, the, the point, Kent's point here is that requirement word is hurting us. It, it's, it, we can deliver a fraction of what's required and make people super happy, or we can deliver everything that's required and still end up with people that are unhappy. That's his point. Focus on the value. Uh, keep your eye on that. But all right, if we go back to agile development, we, we get this uh, focus on small releases. And as a, con uh, as a consequence, uh, a focus on change. We get a, a focus on cross-functional teams. Well, just like the, that new, new product development game thing, we've always sort of known that, certainly since the 80s and even before that. Uh, we get a, a focus on collaboration. And, well, out of, all this, uh, out of all this small releases and change, we get a real focus on technical excellence. We get... Um, we get things like TDD, test-driven development. Uh, we get things like continuous integration. Uh, uh, we get things like software craftsmanship. And look, but I want to come back to the primary measure. Has anybody heard the, the phrase that comes from processes like Scrum, things like potentially shippable software? or a definition of done, or phrases like done, done. We focus on done. Uh, we want to build shippable software. Well, that's one way. But also throughout the 1990s, there were people that were doing this traditional design. In fact, the people that were doing stuff like uh, the new, new product development game, the people that were uh, building cars and cameras and computers, uh, those people were called in, well, they called that industrial, we used to call that industrial design, or they still call it industrial design, when you're designing physical things. One of the big companies that do industrial design was a company called IDEO, and they started describing the way that they work in the late 1990s, uh, they called this design thinking. Has anybody heard of design thinking before? Has anybody been bludgeoned with design thinking and forced to do it? Uh, 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 and, well, you also have people that were designing software that uh, we get uh, what is it, interaction design and UX design. And uh, we have this big school of thought. And these people that are doing design stuff say, look, what we need to do is talk to customers and users and understand their problems. And they would call this research. And, and they might result in building things like personas or things like that. Uh, we, we might force, we want to come up with lots of ideas. And then we would prototype and test those things. Now, these two groups of people hated each other. I was around and I stood in the middle and uh, watched them hate each other. These people refer to all this stuff as a big design up front because it smelled like all those big requirements processes, uh, and that was sort of evil. Uh, uh, and, and these uh, people saw these people just shipping stuff and hoping it would work. Now, there's one person you should know. Um, I'm going to pull out here to finish this history lesson. This 
guy's name is Frank Robinson. Everybody knows Frank Robinson, right? Do you really? I saw that hand. I saw one hand. Uh, Okay, Frank is super important. I had a long conversation with Frank. Frank was one of these product design people. He was doing a lot of that research and testing and things like that. And I, ironically, one of the companies he worked for in the 90s, 80s and 90s was this company Scholastic that actually designed, I, I, when I first time I talked to him, he said, well, this is one of the products I designed. I said, oh my God, when I was a 20 something, I sold tons of that software. That was really good. He said, yeah, that was one of our products at Scholastic and it did really well. Uh, so Frank did this stuff. Now Frank said, look, we need to do just enough of this research and design. There's a lot of pressure uh, to, 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 well, if you ask everybody for what they want, you'll end up with tons of scope and that doesn't guarantee success. Success. If you try and get it out to market fast and don't put enough in it, people might see it and try it and hate it and write bad reviews and then there's no ROI. And the real challenge is figuring out how much to get in this box so that we can maximize our ROI. He said, look, what the hard part here is identifying the, the, the smallest product or release that could meet its desired market outcomes. Now, you all know this to be the definition of the popular term minimum viable product, right? <laughs> uh, has anybody heard this term MVP or minimum viable product before? Does it mean this in your company? No. It doesn't. Uh, what Robinson, when Robinson coined the term minimum viable product in 2001, ironically, same year the manifesto came out, he was championing this design stuff. When he said minimum viable product, when he said product, what he meant was product. And when he said viable, what he meant was successful. Viable products mean they, you release them, they go in the market, they stay, they help sustain your company, we earn ROI on them, and we make money. That's a minimum viable product. It's, it's, it's a, let's call this the smallest successful release. Now, it's important to see that out of these two communities, we have two different kinds of thinking. We've got some people that say just ship it and some people say no, it's got to be viable uh, and we need to do this kind of work to get it. So during the 90s was, a, was uncomfortable for me because I was trying to do both because I was responsible for, for shipping successful products and this stuff works and this stuff works. Now let's talk about how things change or how we finally started to merge the streams here. Let's talk about Fast forward to 2011, because a few interesting things, ironically, seem to happen or come, start to con, con, come together right around 2011. Now, one of the first important people I have to talk about is the guy who wrecked everything. This guy's name is Eric Ries. Has anybody heard of that person before? Okay. Eric, first off, you can tell he's a lot younger. He's not old like me. He's not old like uh, Robinson guy. This guy was uh, in junior high school uh, when I was building software. Uh, he didn't start building software till mid-2000s, and by then, software had fundamentally, well, it, it was starting to change. Now, software is on, the, the internet is big, it's ubiquitous. Uh, we, can, uh, we can sign up for software and use it online. In fact, that's what Eric did. He worked for this company called IMVU. Has anybody heard of IMVU before? For one, that's at least one or a couple people. Has anybody used this product before? This is an example of a failed startup, or it's it actually it's still in business, so it's continuously failing. Uh, um, it isn't making big money for its investors, and Eric was the CTO of this failing startup. Eric was also a huge agile proponent, and he said, look, we built this MVP, but when Eric said MVP, he thought the way to, uh, the, the word MVP was sticky. Everybody likes that term, minimum viable product, because of course that's what we want. He just didn't know that it took research and prototyping and testing to get there. But somebody on his board of directors did. It's this guy named Steve Blank. And Steve Blank said, Eric, you are missing a big important part. And Steve Blank explained things like validated learning to Eric. Now, to, 
Eric, we owe a huge debt of gratitude for socializing and making consumable a lot of the thinking we use today. Uh, so let me, Eric made this validated learning concept super simple to understand. So here's the way validated learning works. Is you start with an idea, just like that other thing, and then you build a backlog. But the backlog isn't filled with features and enhancements. This backlog is filled with things that scare you. Things like risks and assumptions. Things like questions we need to get answered. Because we've got a lot of risks. Uh, you, you all know that, uh, it's, can we deliver this on time? And is this a lot team large enough? Uh, and those are risks. We may not be able to do that. But the even bigger risk is, do we understand the problem we're solving? And will customers actually see and try and use it? And will we enough of them do it that we can actually make money? Those are all big risks that fit into there. And like any backlog, the thing at the top is the most important. The, we'll call this the riskiest assumption. And we take that riskiest assumption and we ask, well, if the riskiest assumption is people will want our solution, let's turn that into a question. Will they want the solution? And then we say, what's the least we could possibly do to answer that question? And, well, if do they want it is the question, then we might build something simple for a prototype and see if they buy it. If, if the question is, can they easily learn how to use it, we might build a prototype for, for that, to, to do usability testing. If the question is, can we build it in time, you don't go build it in time, you identify the risk, the most technical risk, and you build spikes or things like that. But, but what you do is build a test. And then you take that test and oftentimes you got to get out there into the world and put something in front of some people and watch what happens and then all you get back from that is not ROI or happy customers all you get back from that is data but that data helps us change our idea and change our assumptions as I'm simplifying it here but Eric simplified it even more he referred to this cycle as a build measure and learn cycle but the thing that ticks me off about Eric is he sucks at naming things. Um, when people hear the word build, especially people that were using agile development, they think you mean build potentially shippable software, not a prototype, not a test, not do some research. They, they're not thinking build a test, they think build software. When people hear the word measure, they think data. They think I've got something live online and I'm getting analytics back, not I watched someone use a prototype. So build may not mean build, build, measure may not mean measure, but at least learn means learn. <laughs> now, the other thing that Eric noticed is the agile process I'm using does not work anymore because I was doing things in these two-week cycles, but I can get around this build, measure, learn cycle in hours or, or days. Worst case, it might take a, a week uh, or weeks. And the another annoying thing is once I get around to the learn part of the cycle, it's only then do I know what my next riskiest assumption is or whether I uh, keep doing this. So it's, I can't even predict two weeks of work when I'm doing this stuff. He said, look, if I've got to do this stuff in order to flush out risk and in order to be more likely to be right, I need to work this way. This doesn't fit with my regular agile process, but I need to do this faster or I need to reduce the, the cycle time of that stuff. Now that idea of reducing cycle time is one of the themes inside of a, a lean process. Now I know there's some lean people in the audience here. If you're a lean person, where does lean come from? Yeah, is that the Toyota uh, processing? Yeah, that's it. so look, if you've read the Toyota way or looked at some lean stuff, you know that there are 14 principles to lean and only a couple of them deal with reducing cycle time. There's a lot of other things in there, but it ain't all about reducing cycle time. Uh, so Eric borrowed the lean thing, but he borrowed just a little bit of lean. And then Eric happened to work for a failing startup. So he called this book Lean Startup. But the odd thing is it is not very lean and this validated learning thing, it's not a startup thing. It's just a thing. If you're doing anything that has risks, assumptions, or questions, you need to do this. So lean startup, not lean, not for startups. <laughs> now, to add insult to injury, Eric, who did not understand the MVP concept to begin with, he thought it was just, he thought the way you come up with an MVP is not research and design, it's you guess. 
He said, look, we're in a new world. I can just keep shipping releases, and if I get it wrong, I can ship another one. That's, there's no box. I didn't have to print a ton of CDs. I didn't have to put a bullet list of features on the back of the box. Uh, I can just change it. Uh, so we need to stop focusing on what's in the box, and we need to focus on this next best test. So he redefined MVP to, to be the smallest thing you could do or make to test a product hypothesis. We use hypothesis because it sounds better than guess, uh, <laughs> because that's sort of all it is. Now, you may, a lot of you may use the term MVP, and you may mean something a little bit more like this. But the, the tragedy of this was when Eric changed this, when he said product, what he meant was test. And when he said viable, what he meant is you learn something. So now viable product means a test that lets you learn something. That doesn't make sense at all to regular humans. Uh, and it's, what's interesting is these two definitions aren't subtly different. These two definitions are polar opposites. And now we have a really big problem. Um, let's... Here, look, I'm, I like think of this as my smallest successful release, and this is my next best test. And uh, if I say it that way, people don't get them confused with each other. Now, finally, if you live in a world where nobody understands either term, if you live in a world where the goal is to get the most stuff you can in, in time, we get the other MVP definition, which is sort of that, uh, most I could get in time, um, uh, or also known as first crappy release. <laughs> I'm going to tell you to stop using that term outright, or say, we are shipping a small and successful release, or we're working on our next best test, or we are shipping our first crappy release. Just be clear with people uh, what you're doing. Now, this stuff came out in 2011, and in 2011, we start getting good at this stuff, and we start building prototypes and testing things. I'm going to play a little bit of a video from, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff I could show, but I'm going to play a little bit of a video from my friend Henrik Nieberg. Uh, people have seen these Spotify engineering culture videos, right? Everybody knows about tribes and squads and uh, guilds and uh, chapters of guilds. And we, look, we, we, I saw the, in the five-minute talks today people talking about that. But this is in the second video, and this is the part that nobody re watches because by the time we, our heads were blown by tribes and squads, I don't want to see the rest of them. Uh, but this describes Spotify's process. Now, he is going to use the term MVP, but I want you to listen closely in the one-minute video here. He does not mean MVP as ship software that is shippable to everyone. It is not shipped at scale. Listen to what it means, listen to who it goes to, because it is not everyone, and listen to what is left out of it. Our product development approach is based on lean startup principles, and is summarized by the mantra, think it, build it, ship it, tweak it. The biggest risk is always building the wrong thing. So before deciding to build a new product or major feature, we try to inform ourselves with research. Do people actually want this? Does it solve a real problem for them? Then we define a narrative, kind of like a press release or an elevator pitch showing off the benefits. For example, radio you can save or follow your favorite artist. We also define hypotheses. How will this feature impact user behavior and our core metrics? Will they share more music? Will they log in more often? And we build various prototypes and have people try them out to get a sense of what the feature might feel like and how people react. Once we feel confident this thing is worth building, we go ahead and build an MVP, minimum viable product. Just enough to fulfill the narrative, but far from feature complete. You might call it the minimum lovable product. The next stage of learning happens once we put something into production. So we want to get there as quickly as possible. We release the MVP to just a few percent of all users and use techniques like A-B testing to measure the impact and test their hypotheses. The squad monitors the data and continues tweaking and redeploying until they see the desired impact. Then they gradually roll out to the rest of the world while taking the time needed to sort out practical stuff like operational issues and scaling. By the time the product or feature is fully rolled out, 
We already know it's a success, because if it isn't, we don't roll it out. Impact is always more important than velocity, so a feature isn't really considered done until it has achieved the desired impact. Note that, like most things in this video, this is how we try to work, but our actual track record, of course, varies. So let's, if you heard, they used MVP to, to talk, describe something with shipping. He did talk about doing all those prototypes and things like that, and these days when we talk about MVPs, we, it could be a, a prototype or it could be a test or a press release or other things like he talked about. But when he talked about shipping an MVP, it was just enough to fulfill the desired narrative or the, fulfill the narrative, but far from feature complete. It wasn't going to be successful, and they knew it, and they know it, and, and any good product company knows it. But since we know it, we're going to ship it to just a, a few percent of, of users. I work with companies that build B2B software or build it for internal use, and they will find a, a small group of, of partner customers or a, a place to start. And because we're going to have to iterate until they're happy, because it would be stupid to ship something that isn't successful to everyone. It's a big waste of money, and since a lot of ideas don't work, we wouldn't do that. And because we're shipping to a few percentage of users, and they are friendly users, and they're, well, they're people that are, well, that know they're getting a beta, or people that we can risk not have, having it be right for, we leave out functionality. Um, you know, it's far from feature complete. It's just enough for them to do it so that we can get the wheel spinning. We also leave out a lot of stuff that we need to scale. Because, especially at Spotify scale, shipping to a few percentage of users is thousands, but shipping to all of them is millions and is localized into several different languages. And the cost of software at scale for big companies is huge. If you're a startup and you don't have any customers, and scale is the for one, is the same as anybody. Uh, uh, so that's easier. And the other thing is if we, sh again, we're in a big company, if we're gonna ship it at scale to everybody, he mentioned, well, these operational concerns. I work with companies that, uh, look, if they're gonna ship a test, they let customer service know we're shipping something and uh, we're gonna ship it to a subset of users that's only gonna appear in this geographic reason, region, and you should know a little bit about it. And if calls come in on it, re refer it to a couple people that know. But if we're gonna ship it at scale, all the, uh, but, well, all the support people need to be trained on it, and uh, there are big implications to shipping at scale. A lot of companies don't understand this MVP thing, and if they're still locked into old-school agile thinking, they ship crap at scale. And, uh, well, the chances of it working aren't very good. But look, by 2011, we get this. Uh, Eric Ries taught us how to merge the streams, and now we can have design and engineering work together. And ironically, in 2011, DevOps uh, rises up. This guy's name is John Jenkins. He gave a speech in 2011. Has anybody ever seen a DevOps talk before? Are you still with me? It's late. And have you ever heard this quote that at Amazon, we ship every 11.6 seconds. Everybody heard that quote is everywhere. First off, that quote is from 2011, so it's freaking eight years old. I hope they're faster now. I hope they've gotten better than that in eight years. And I don't know what the ratio of, of shipments per team is, but the other thing you gotta know, and, and he's with Amazon, and this is what he's saying at this talk, easy to find the talk online, uh, is well, they ship this frequently, but you gotta know that they are not shipping new features or releases to everybody. They are doing exactly what Nieberg just described, shipping little things to a small percentage of users, iterating until it's successful because they won't release it to everybody unless it is, uh, and pulling it back if it's not. These are tiny changes. Uh, one of the things that we now can do, uh, we, you know, the old days when we, built to test, we built prototypes, things like this, but now we can build and put things in the market and we can build to learn. A lot of companies mistake building to learn with building to earn, and uh, we know that if we build something to learn, well, we don't have to worry about, well, we don't have to worry about all of our users. We don't need, we can leave functionality out, we can leave scale out, and the, but the goal is to keep getting around this loop until we're sure it's gonna work. Now let me add one more piece to 2011, and let's catch us up to now and see where this leaves us. This guy's name is Mark Andreessen. He is the person that Marty Kagan worked for in uh, the 90s, uh, way back then. Um, Mark Andreessen is known as a, uh, well, he's, he runs a venture capital firm called Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, they're behind people like 
I don't know, lots of Skype and Twitter and uh, people like that. Uh, you should listen to the A16Z podcast, which talks about a lot of things going on in technology. Anybody heard of that podcast before? The A16, good, at least one person. Uh, in 2011, Andreessen wrote an essay uh, that he keeps calling back to, and the, the essay was titled, Why Software is Eating the World, and he predicted that software will eat the world, that everything that can be software will be software. And uh, what's interesting is that he was actually not ambitious enough uh, in that. Uh, in 2008, phones became computers. And now uh, Apple's big innovation was taking all the freaking buttons off the phone. Uh, in, before the iPhone, I would buy a phone, and if I uh, didn't like the features, I would get a new phone. But now the phone changes constantly. Uh, uh, phones, when's the last time you actually made a phone call on a phone? And now when we say phone, uh, it, it doesn't mean something we talk to people on. It, it does a ton of things for us. Watches are not watches anymore. Uh, they tell us a lot of things other than time. Light bulbs are not even light bulbs anymore. Uh, we can turn them off and I can turn light bulbs in my house on and off from here, which will freak my family out. When my vacuum cleaner is done vacuuming, it will send me a map of what it is vacuumed. Uh, and I don't, yours should too. Uh, it, it, my poor wimpy vacuum cleaner will cry when it's stuck under a couch also and text me about that as well. A whiny thing. Uh, the, uh, the thermostats aren't thermostats anymore. We don't have a home security like this, uh, but if my wife knew that she could watch the dogs at home, we would. Um, uh, look, a long time ago, game development was a big thing. To develop a new game took years. You would work hard, take a couple years, you would release it, and it would either be awesome or it would tank. But now, the biggest games in the world are things that did not take very long, released rough, continuously grew. The biggest game in the world, the one that scares the crap out of all game developers, is Fortnite. And Fortnite was, well, the company that, does anybody know anything about Fortnite? It was released as a box game that sucked or didn't do very well, and they released a free version that was scaled down, and, and then that, and then iterated their way to wild success. Uh, Electronic Arts released this thing this year, and it bumped their stock price 10%. And the idea that games iteratively improve is now commonly understood. Um, we all know that TV isn't TV anymore and movies aren't movies anymore, that the biggest investors in entertainment are th these people, are Netflix and Amazon. Um, I, look, I can't, I will not, I, is any, are there any people who watch Game of Thrones here? I refused to tune in every Sunday. I waited for the whole thing to finish airing, and then I binged the whole thing in two days. Uh, the, the way we watch series now is different. It's fundamentally changed things, and the way entertainment works is different. Um, uh, banks aren't banks anymore, and uh, uh, I had to speak at a, a, a bank, so I included a bunch of logos that scared banks. All those, if you're a bank, those logos scare banks. Uh, because they know that uh, if I'm a traditional bank, the people I have to worry about are those people. We all know that the software we use doesn't come in a box anymore. We subscribe to it. Uh, we, uh, we pay monthly. If we stop paying, we, we lose it. It works more like a service and it continuously improves. Uh, uh, we used to use, look, even software companies used to use this model year concept like car manufacturers. Remember when Microsoft had a model year on Windows? You got a 98 and then a 2000 and then they, and a, uh, and they finally gave up on that. Uh, and cars don't even work like cars anymore. If you have a Tesla in your driveway, you will get updates on your Tesla every day that change what your Tesla does. I have a German car and the and the entertainment system in my German car is finally awesome because it isn't German. Um, it's because my car integrates with CarPlay and there is a Google standard for that, but my German car does, still does not receive upgrades that increase its speed. Now, look, if you think, so cars aren't cars anymore and jet engines aren't even jet engines anymore. 
uh, this company, Rolls-Royce, stopped selling jet engines a long time ago. They launched something called Power by the Hour. You don't buy a jet engine, you lease a jet engine, and you pay for its use. And as a consequence, a Rolls-Royce jet engine and now GE jet engines are covered with internet, first off, they're computers, they're covered with sensors and Internet of Things enabled devices, and people at Rolls-Royce headquarters know when that jet engine is in service, know when it's breaking down, they gather data from those jet engines, and they continuously watch and improve these jet engines. This is the way products work today. And what, where, well, I guess where Andreessen was wrong is not software is eating the world, but software, the internet, computers embedded in everything, and, uh, well, uh, AI and machine learning and everything. So look, if I were to ask you what makes a product great in 2019, if you think of all those products, what are characteristics of all the products you use today or those products I just showed you that make them great? Yes, they do all these things, but what else? What today? Say again? Looks good? Do they, uh, well, I'm gonna probably tell them it looks good, but let me add to that, they get better. Um, in fact, a lot of them don't even look good out of the box and they get better over time. What else? They adapt, yeah. They get feedback. How do they get feedback, by the way? Yeah, I was gonna say that well, they, they probably talk to their users, but they rely really heavily on getting lots of data. Anything else? Yeah, they're more uh, accessible, and that might be because, uh, well, I'm gonna, uh, accessible. Yeah, uh, there's no store, no box, no store. There's just the, Freaking internet. Um, yeah, they're personalized uh, because uh, the, maybe they have data that knows how you use it and they have things like AI or uh, machine learning and things like that. Uh, there are four, are they really? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, they're more affordable than uh, other things, but you're not paying the 10 bucks a month that I pay to Microsoft for Office. Uh, and so all right. over time, I think I'm paying Microsoft more than I ever used to. So uh, uh, that's, that's, let me put this in quotes, because I don't believe you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll pull out a couple things. Uh, look, they, they integrate uh, with each other. Slack was wildly successful because it plugs into anything. Uh, 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 all those things integrate. Uh, your car integrates with CarPlay, and uh, Slack integrates with everything else. And uh, yes, these things are all on the internet. And uh, now I've got to worry about this IoT thing or this Internet of Things thing. So uh, we look at computers that talk to each other or uh, uh, things like that. This is the world we live in today. Say that again. Uh, availability, yeah, so it, look, yeah, it's, it's, it's easily accessible, they're uh, more available. Uh, say that again, the, yeah, they work like services. Say it again? Yeah, they can try for free, uh, because we, when we used to have a cell box, we couldn't go to your house and take it from you, now we can just turn it off. Uh, you can try it for free if you stop paying to that. I'm gonna stop you, this is enough. I've made my point. Uh, <laughs> The point I really want to make is that if you thought you were building in short iterations so that you could see progress faster and make stakeholders happy, I'm telling you that you live in this world and we're working in short iterations so your company does not die. The banks, I get a ton of business from banks and a ton of business from insurance companies and every company is trying to, uh, it's funny, embedded in this idea of adopting Agile is this market need of keeping up and adapt, of making products that are more accessible, that uh, are, get more data, that release faster, teams that can learn faster, uh, that get better continuously. These are the needs, these are needs of the market, not the process, things like that. If we draw a process that revolves around our product and our customers, some happy and some unhappy, uh, this process is a continuous cycle. We have to uh, sense or learn what's going on. Uh, we've got products out there in the market and we need data from those products. 
uh, we use face-to-face -face conversation. And out of paying attention to our customers, we end up learning a lot. We generate a ton of options, most of which will suck. Since most of those ideas will suck, we, well, we respond, but we, we respond with tests because it would be crazy to just start shipping everything. We do these build, measure, learn cycles, and when we are confident, uh, then we finally respond at scale. That's where those, uh, that's where that sprint cycle, as we use it today, works. So cycle by cycle, we build a little bit of shippable software and a little bit more and a little bit more, and we finally ship it. But like my friend Henrik said, we don't do that until we're confident it's going to be successful. The impact is the most important thing. Now, I am a little bit over time, but that's where I needed to get to. The, the world is a different place. The, if we're going to compete, uh, you know, for a lot of the companies I work with, the idea of being agile or the idea of doing lean thinking, things like that, is just is sort of a, a duh. Uh, if, if, if I work at Atlassian, if I work at Spotify or work at other companies like that, of course they do all those things because they couldn't survive in the market. And banks are starting to realize they need to, and other companies are too. And the, the, you know, the company that, you know, Tesla is the company that scared German car manufacturers straight, or caused them to want to do this stuff more. Every company has got, uh, well, I guess the company that scares the crap out of everybody, and maybe I'll end with this guy. Uh, this is the richest man in the world. Uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, I like this particular quote, the good process serves you so you can serve your customers, but if you're not watchful, the process can become the thing. Bezos did not set out to be awesome at Agile, awesome at collaboration. In fact, he's sort of known for being mean to people, but he is focused on building stuff that is successful in the market, and that's what drives uh, their process. I am going to end there. Thank you very much for listening to all this stuff. All right, let's uh, let's take a few questions, shall we? Anybody you want, want to? to? Is, there, is there alcohol out there? There is alcohol out there, but I think they can hang. Maybe no They one can wants. hang on for a bit. I expect. Yeah. Do we have any questions, or shall we just hit the alcohol after a talk like that? Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> I didn't talk about story mapping or anything like that. I can <laughs> I can talk there about these things too. Hi, it's Evan. Since you didn't talk about story mapping, how does this fit with story mapping, what you told us now? Now, say that one more time. Since, since I you have not talked about story mapping, would you be able to talk a bit about story mapping and how this story mapping fits with this story? Yeah, uh, maybe. <laughs> So when I teach people to build software, the first thing I will ask them to do is to not find something in their backlog and story map it. The first thing I ask people to do is tell me about the users you already have. Uh, because you've already got something, unless you're a startup, you already have users and you already have a product. The first thing I ask them to do is tell me a story about the people currently using your product. Or let's uh, pull back this other model. Uh, tell me a story about how they use your product now. And, uh, well, it, step by step, they'll build a map that say first users do this and then this and then this. Uh, and we end up with a, a bit of a map here. And then, once we've got a bit of a map there that describes the way people use it, I will say, tell me where it sucks, because I know it does. Uh, uh, and they will tell me where the pains are and where the uh, uh, problems are. And I'll say, well, tell me where it's awesome, because if people use it at all, there's got to be some awesome parts, and you better know what they are. Uh, and then I'll say, OK, great. Here's some sucking parts and some awesome parts. What are the ideas that are currently in your backlog? Do they fix any of the sucking parts? Do they amplify any of the awesome parts? And right away, a map like this helps us recognize what's going on. And then if I'm going to ship anything, um, well, I have to be good at imagining the future. Because these users are going to see, try, use, and keep using it. So tell me a story about what that looks like. If this is your user on this persona, tell me a story about how they would step-by-step -step use that product. 
and uh, break it down. But this is a different kind of map. This is a, a map about the future. This is our prediction. And then we'll ask here, look, if I build a bunch of stuff into this map, uh, and I illustrate a lot of options in this map, then I ask, gosh, it's, it's the new world here, and I want to know what is the smallest successful release. Not what's the most I can get in time, but how much do I need, and people who have used story maps learn how to use them to slice out smallest successful releases. We narrowly focus on specific users, we narrowly focus on what allows them to be successful, and allows us to find, I've always used maps to find smaller successful releases, and then, well, release strategies, ways to, ways to, uh, well, remember, we're not in a world where we want to deliver big releases in boxes anymore. We're in a world where uh, things get better continuously and change continuously. So we want to ship even smaller releases more frequently, and the technology we have kind of uh, supports that. So without being able to think from a user's perspective about how they would do things, I can't imagine just dropping features in a backlog and building... I, I, can't, I can, never, can never answer that, what's the highest priority feature thing uh, without well, thinking through from an outcome perspective. I don't know if that, that's a long answer. Uh, it's, a, it's a good open-ended question. But for me, I end up, uh, as the inventor of this hammer, everything is a nail uh, to me. So I will use maps and visualizations. And again, I sat with the, with the folks doing event storming the, the, today in do domain-driven design. Look, a big map or a big picture is super useful to, to help us understand what's going on in the system we have today. Long answer. We'll, and then we'll. Uh, yeah, we we'll could have answered game. three more if I would have just answered Hi. concisely. I know you stated you stated in the beginning not to care, not to let's say focus on the people, yeah. but since product owners, product manager must go and work on my, to work on Monday, so what's your advice to them? I'll say that again. Uh, since uh, most, uh, since people since have to go to work on owners, Monday. Product owners, product managers that are in this room will go to work on Monday. What's your advice to them? A second. Let's see if I've got a slide for this. Uh, I don't know if I've got the slide. Oh well. There is an old saying: uh, if you were raised by a bad mother or a bad parent, uh, you've got to imagine a, a child in the back seat. Uh, crying about something annoying, and the parent turns to the child in the back seat and says, if you keep crying, I will give you something to cry about. Now, what that means, uh, uh, whatever you're worried about, uh, I'm going to give you something bigger to worry about. And my rule of thumb uh, to people and companies and teams is to say, look, if you keep crying, I am going to remind you that most of what we are building sucks, and most of it won't work and our customers don't like our product, give your, if you're a product owner, make your, help people understand who your customers and users actually are. Map your product or do, take them out to see your product. Give them something bigger to cry about. I promise you the thing that will focus people and cause them to work together as a team faster than anything is caring about what they're building, caring about the people they're solving, solving problems for. And ironically, and you provided a good cap to that, ironically, that is the point of this silly original paper, the new, new product development game. The real point those uh, authors are making, there's the paper, is that these teams work like cross-functional teams because they care about the things they're building. Uh, there's uh, lots of stories in here about the time they spend with their actual customers and users. That's the only advice I've I got for you. Give them something better to cry about. Thank you very much. Okay. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs>